All right, hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. This is Rob for Smirking Gun Reviews, and we're back with The Man in the High Castle. We are now at the beginning of Season 2, which is Episode 1, The Tiger's Cave. Um, so if you haven't seen the episode, uh, this will be full of spoilers. Um, and this is kind of like uh, a lot of season premieres. You got everybody kind of doing their own thing, so everybody gets a little bit of something to do. And a little bit more. Uh, so... Let's just kind of start, and we'll just go with each character. So, uh, Tagomi, after he had his little trip to 1960s alternate America, where they didn't win and we did, uh, there is a very nice kind of whimsical, uh, like kind of a happy feeling that the guy gets. Like, the, the world isn't the way it is here. You know, they're happy. You know, so not like it is here. <laughs> Um, and Tagomi, you know, doesn't really have that much to do in this episode, except that, you know, through him we're introduced to this general who talks about the Heisenberg device, which leads to Kido talking to Tagomi about, you know, hey man, I know that that's what you and, uh, Wagner were up to, and Tagomi's like, well, what are you gonna do? You know, you know, arrest me? And the guy's just kind of like, you know, he, he's not understanding that Tagomi just and Wagner were trying to do something good, something better. Um, and Tagomi telling him, you know, that the atomic bomb that happens here, it's not, it's, this is not a war that anybody can win. And this is bigger than us. This is bigger than just some stupid, you know. But Kido, he's a hardcore cop that's, he doesn't give a shit about, you know, like, personal feelings, really. He's just about what he's told to do, and then he follows it. He's a robot. Then you got uh, Tagomi, uh, who eventually calls uh, Wagner's wife out in uh, Germany and tells her that her husband died uh, trying to do something better for the world. And that's that's pretty much all that, you, that we have for him. But it's he's going to have such a huge role uh, going forward. Now, let's go to Joe. Joe uh, is, is on the boat with these guys who are, you know, taking him away. Uh, he's giving way too much attention to the fact that he wants to get on the radio to talk to Juliana. I gotta make sure that she's, you know, okay. Uh, whatever. Uh, I just, I guess... So eventually they get the radio working and they pull knives on. They're like, dude, you're a Nazi. Okay, we're gonna we're just gonna fucking kill you. We want the film. You know. Joe plays the only hand he has, which is to start to dump the film overboard. Which would get him killed anyway. Um, so it's like, well you can either kill me and lose the film, or you know, I'll you know, it, it so he tells them, look, I'm not a Nazi. Liar. Um, and maybe in his mind he's not. You know, maybe he is caught up, you know, way over his head. Which I do believe that that's mostly the way it is. Um, but he tells them that he is selling it to the Nazis. And that these guys can make a whole bunch of money. You know, he's promising them like 200,000 yen each. And it's like, I mean, I don't know. If I were these guys, I'd be like, well, what's to stop you from killing us as soon as you get, you know, they get the film. They are Nazis. They're not to be trusted. We're just a bunch of guys working on a little boat. <laughs> but a seaplane shows up with a whole bunch of money and booze and girly magazines. I mean, really nice touches here. Like, holy shit. It's, it's, it's one thing... What? So Joe gets on the plane, and these guys are like, all right. Now, first off, let's just get, okay, so Joe gets on the plane. They're all happy. They got their money. They got their booze. They got their girly magazines. Oh, and they also got the bomb that's in the bottom that explodes and blows them all to hell. So I guess, here's, here's the thing. Shouldn't have made deals with Nazis. Oh, for Christ's sake. Uh, 
shouldn't have made deals with Nazis. And uh, I just fucking love this thing. There we go. Shouldn't make deals with Nazis. Can't trust them. They'll just, like I said, they're probably going to turn on you as soon as uh, they get the, what they want. There's nothing to stop them. Why would they give a bunch of money away to a bunch of people that they you know, don't have to? Second of all, since this was set up by Overgroup and Fear Smith, I mean, it's pretty hardcore. Like, why did he have to throw in the booze and the girly magazines? Like, it's just the, the attention to detail. Like, oh, hey, man, let's really make them happy right before I fucking blow them up. There's a definite level of evil to that. <laughs> and, and just, like, like a, an absolute fuck these guys, I'm going to blow them up attitude. Um... That he didn't have to add those details to it. You know, like, I don't know. He's just diabolical. And so Joe gets back. He's congratulated by Overgroup and Fira Smith, which I, I smiled at. Like, his affection for Joe actually made me smile for a second. Like, oh, that's, that's so nice that they have this connection. I keep having to tell myself he's a fucking Nazi. That no matter what, you know, he, at this point, if he turns, has a character turn where he tries to do good for the sake of, let's say, his family, it's still one of those ha-ha moments to me. Like, you're going to get what, you're a traitor. You know, you, you get what you get. But this show can still sometimes make me feel something for people that I shouldn't. Um, but Joe, speaking of feeling things that they shouldn't, Joe feels like he does not want a part of this anymore. And he doesn't care this, uh, as apparently he finds out that his dad knows he's been working for over here from Fear of Smith. And he, he's not the man he wanted to be. And that disappoints Smith. And, but they still let him go. But you know that that's not the end of the story. And so that's, that's pretty much it for Joe here. And since we're on Smith... You know, uh, his wife's worried. Uh, and to deal with Smith, we go to right at the beginning of the episode where they're doing, like, the crazy-ass Pledge of Allegiance, but German Nazi style. That was fucking weird. I don't think they've ever done a cold open. Maybe they did at the very beginning of the show. I just don't remember, but this was, like, their first cold open in a while. And, yeah, the whole thing with the kids is just creepy. But speaking of which, uh, so his wife... Is worried there's a car there, but it turns out to be Smith. So they live to, you know, and to tell another story or not live another day. And, you know, so through that, you've got this, this whole thing with Joe. And then he's got to go to Germany to meet the Fuhrer. And uh, this is where you see, you know, old Hitler having his Parkinson's moment and uh, watching the film that he gets, and he's ha he just snaps. He fucking loses it when he sees the atomic bombs going off. Um, and uh, just tells Smith, basically, you know, he brought him all the way to Berlin to tell him, yeah, thanks for finding the traitor, Heydrich, but loyalty's not enough. We need to find the man in the high castle. And so, you know, do you understand? Like, don't try, do. Do or do not. There is no try. We're going to fear Smith. So, it was that important to drag him out to fa have a face-to-face -face about understanding how important the, finding the man in the high castle is. So, that's Smith's story. Um, and now we have F Frank. So, Frank, <laughs> he's smashing things in his house because he's all pissed off that Ed's taking the fall for his not crime. Neither of them committed a crime. And, and both of them want to uh, confess to it so that the other one doesn't have to die. Well, Arnold, I screwed up the guy's name. I called him Oliver last time. Arnold, uh, Julian is like stepdad or whatever, comes over and tells Frank eventually that he needs to find a pawn. Like somebody that has connections in the Japanese government you know, or in Japanese, you know, somebody with high standing in the Japanese community to help get Ed out. Because this still needs to be a plot line. Um, 
So Frank uh, has taken the reins from Ed at being the guy who comes into rooms like way more intensely than he needs to <laughs> by going to Robert the antique dealer's place. Um, and, and literally he's, he comes from, like through the door like He's being chased down by fucking dogs, like, just way more intense than he needs to be, okay? Did you run the whole way? You know, once you get there, it's not going to be like, I don't know. The urgency didn't need to have that kind of entrance. So poor Robert the Antique Dealer, Rob, whatever, um, he wants to know, Frank wants to sell, you know, more forgeries, but Frank is just there to... Again, strong arm this guy into thinking that he's kind of responsible for Ed's situation and Frank's situation, that he could be in big as trouble as them. But really, it, he, he doesn't have to. I mean, if Frank wants to be a real dick about it, he can go to the Kempertai and say that he bought bullets from this guy. But, I mean, the guy's already done his due day, you know, done more than he has to. And I feel like Frank's kind of a fucking asshole for dragging him even further into it. But I do like this actor. I do like this character. So they eventually figure out to go to back to the lawyer that he sold that thing to, which is stupid. Come on, don't press your luck. But he's a defense attorney. And they get there. They start asking him questions about, you know, what can they do about Ed? Because you're a defense lawyer. But this guy doesn't give a shit. And Frank... I love the antique dealer's reactions to how Frank basically, did, not even basically, Frank tells the guy, we fooled you. This is a forgery. We sold you a forgery. I made it. He sold it to you. And the, the antique dealer is like, can't believe what he's hearing. This guy is selling him, selling them both down the river, throwing each other, throwing both of them under the bus. Now the guy's like, you're not going anywhere. I was just like, man, how much more of a fucking stupid prick does Frank have to be in this situation? I know he's got some purpose, but it's, you know, if I'm the antique dealer, I'm wishing that I, I had just, you know, not agreed to any of this. And let him just say, go ahead, tell everybody that I sold you bullets, fuck you. So, that's where Frank's at right now. And now we get to Juliana. So, Juliana, um... After not killing Joe, uh, was like drugged basically, and she f sees this flash of all of her life, leading up to this part where she's in front of a bus and gets hit, and the film melts. So it's kind of like she's seeing a film strip, or is it just a bunch of films that somebody else is watching, whatever. So she gets brought to this guy named Gary, played by. Uh, Callum Keith Rennie, or Reno, I think his name is. He's been in everything. Like, I remember mostly from, like, Battlestar Galactica and things like that. Um, he is one of those guys, like, they want to kill her because of what she didn't do, which is kill Joe. But they get her to the man in the... Well, this guy named Avinson. Now, is he the man in the high castle? I don't know. I feel like it's a bait-and-switch kind of situation. But he's at a place where he's got all the films. And this guy is played by Stephen Root, who I really love. He's one of the better, best character actors from the last like 20, 25 years. Um, and I always like it when he plays kind of intense. Uh, and he is pretty intense in this. And he needs to know from her like who she saw in this film. Is it the same person as right here and there? Uh, he's not there to like listen to her whine about... like. Um, her problems. He needs information about these films that what she's seen. Um, and they have all this like nice little philosophical moments about stuff and talking specifically to for us to uh, uh, you know, the audience to start understanding that there's all these multiple realities of things going on that every person, you know, every choice can create a new universe. You can be different. You can be a dick. You can be the same. All depends on th certain things that happen. And since she can't, you know, conveniently story-wise, uh, remember who this guy is that she wants her to remember. They again, they shoot her like with gas or something to knock her out. And they plan on killing her, even though Abinson said no. But this other guy, Gary, he's got a hard-on for killing Juliana. 
But she is in the trunk. She manages to get out just past a Japanese checkpoint. Um, and it was really perfectly timed. So she jumps out of the trunk. And they pull around. And the Japanese guy's like, what the fuck are you doing? So the soldier like has the gun on him. They start opening fire. She's like beat up and really is taking a long time to get out of the road. But she manages to get away. There's a shootout. And Karen... The other resistance lady, I kept repeating her name, she dies in the road. And Gary kills the Japanese soldiers, like, out of anger. And Juliana, who should be running, is, you know, stopped and she's gotten away. And that's pretty much it. Uh, and it's a really good setup episode. It is kind of just the new, where's everybody since the finale? Here's where they're headed episode. So going forward, it will, you know, at least we have the ball rolling into what's going on next. So anyway, great season for now, a season premiere. Can't wait for to rewatch all the rest of them because I really can't. Re I remember even less about this one than I did this the first season. And that's saying something. So anyway, if you like this review, please hit the like button, subscribe, comment, share, all that jazz. Um notifications all that stuff so can't wait to do i'll uh, probably do at least one episode tomorrow so we'll do episode two tomorrow this is rob smirking interview saying oh my god it's 11 20 at night i gotta go to bed because i got another long day of work tomorrow <sighs> so we'll see you in the next video have a great night Bye bye